Welcome to This Week in Amateur Radio. We are all about amateur radio and the big wide world of communications. We are in our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community, and we are heard on amateur repeaters, low power FM broadcasts, and of course, via our pioneering work in the world of podcasting. So let's get the program started with a list of the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1224 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Two upcoming amateur radio conventions will be emphasizing youth and learning. We will have team coverage. MFJ Enterprises celebrates its 50th anniversary. The Federal Emergency Management Agency alerts broadcasters nationwide to recently discovered vulnerabilities to the emergency alert system. Russian space debris is wreaking havoc with SpaceX Starlink satellites. An amateur radio satellite built by students in India suffers a failed launch attempt. The League has a brand new station, W1HQ, built at their brand new radio lab. We will tell you all about it. Hi Z Antennas announces a new manufacturer and distributor. Two new grants from Amateur Radio Digital Communications are distributed. We will tell you who was on the receiving end. And a special event station in the UK is inspired by one ham recovering from cancer. We will tell you all about this heartwarming story in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to explain the different digital memory measurement standards. Australia's own Otto Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will explain how you can best play the microphone gain game. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of his summer series, Amateur Radio History Headlines. This week, Bill takes us above the fold for what made amateur radio headlines during the first half of the 1960s. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, puts aside his tools and climbing belt for part four of his six-part series on how to write a successful public service announcement to promote your club's upcoming ham fest or special event to the general public on local broadcast radio stations. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air this week in amateur radio takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in the suburbs surrounding Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from Cortlandville, New York, in the heart of the Seven Valleys, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our amateur radio outpost in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where it's almost a perfect fall type day for August, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson. W-A-2-H-O-Y. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, officially in the middle of the dog days of summer, I'm Eric, KD2-RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where the thermometers are heading north for the summer, I'm Will Rogers, K5-W-L-R. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1-K-I-N. Leading off the news this week, Two major ham radio events in August will host division conventions for ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. On August 20th through the 21st, the Huntsville Ham Fest will be the host of the ARRL Southeastern Division Convention at the Von Braun Center in Huntsville, Alabama. On August 26th through the 28th, the Northeast Ham Exposition will host the combined ARRL New England and Hudson Division Conventions at the Best Western Royal Plaza Hotel and Trade Center in Marlboro, Massachusetts. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with more details. Both conventions include an exceptional amount of programming to encourage and instruct radio amateurs across a variety of interests, said ARRL Education and Learning Manager Steve Goodgame, K5ATA. Goodgame, who used his recent experience as a school teacher to help high school students earn their ham radio licenses, will participate in both events. 
He will lead forums to share ways for engaging youth and offer tools and tips for approaching schools about including amateur radio in their programs and curriculum. The Huntsville Ham Fest will also include a youth lounge where young prospective hams can participate in hands-on activities and demonstrations, including kit building, fox hunting, that's finding the hidden transmitter, and opportunities to get on the air. Other forums of the convention will cover topics geared toward inspiring attendees to get more active and involved in amateur radio. Forums at the Huntsville Ham Fest include Arduino, The Next Generation, with ARRL author Glenn Popeil, KW5GP, Grounding and Bonding, with ARRL editor and author Ward Silver, N0AX, Fox Hunting 101, with co-presenters Joe Domaleski, KI4ASK, and Mary Catherine Domaleski, KI4HHI. And Kit Building Techniques for Success, presented by ARRL Handbook Contributor Joe Eisenberg, K0NEB. Eisenberg is also the speaker for the Saturday Grand Banquet at the Northeast Ham Exposition. And now, with more details on the upcoming Northeast Ham Exposition, we go to our own Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. The Northeast Ham Exposition will host the combined ARRL New England and Hudson Division conventions at the Best Western Royal Plaza Hotel and Trade Center in Marlborough, Massachusetts, August 26th through the 28th, 2022. A similar lineup of forums has been organized for the Northeast Ham Exposition, including How to Solve Radio Frequency Interference, Linux in Your Ham Shack, and Playing Radio Outside. With more details on the Northeast Ham Exposition, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ. ARL will have exhibits at both conventions where attendees can connect with membership program representatives and elected volunteers from the board of directors and field organizations. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, and CEO Dave Minster, NA2AA, will attend the Huntsville Ham Fest. Minster will give the opening keynote address on Saturday at the Northeast Ham Exposition. Audrey McElroy, KM4BUN, an 18-year-old student who recently started her studies at Georgia Institute of Technology, that's known as Georgia Tech, will be presented with the 2022 Bill Pasternick WA6ITF Memorial Amateur Radio Newsline Young Ham of the Year Award. That'll be at the Huntsville Ham Fest. In July, the ARRL Foundation awarded McElroy a $25,000 scholarship sponsored by the Amateur Radio Digital Communications, ARDC. Proceeds from the Northeast Ham Exposition to go to Famara School Scholarship Fund, which helps students attend a college or trade school of their choice. Scholarships are administered by the ARRL Foundation Scholarship Program. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. The convention exhibit halls will also include the participation of manufacturers and equipment resellers, an opportunity for attendees to browse and shop in person for the latest in amateur radio equipment and accessories. Among the confirmed exhibitors for the Huntsville Ham Fest are ABR Industries, Bridgecom Systems, Diamond Antennas, DX Engineering, Elecraft, Flex Radio Systems, Gigaparts, Ham Radio Outlet, ICOM America, MFJ Enterprises, N3ZN Keys, RT Systems, Step IR Communication Systems, and Yesu USA. Exhibits at Northeast Ham Exposition will include, among others, Alacraft, Ham Radio Outlet, Monobeam, and Quicksilver Radio Products. Both conventions include a flea market. Visit the official convention websites for advanced tickets and a complete listing of activities. Huntsville Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Southeastern Division Convention in Huntsville, Alabama, August 20th and 21st, 2022. A list of all ARRL sanctioned ham fest and conventions is published at www.arrl.org slash hamfest and includes these upcoming events. QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, which is an online event on September 17th and 18th, 2022, ARRL is a QSO Today partner. HRO Superfest, hosting the ARRL Central Division Convention, being held in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, on September 23rd and 24th, 2022. Red River Radio Amateur Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Dakota Division Convention, being held in West Fargo, North Dakota, September 24th, 2022. 
ARRL Rocky Mountain Division Convention in Cheyenne, Wyoming on October 7th through the 9th, 2022. And finally, Pacificon, hosting the ARRL Pacific Division Convention, being held in San Ramon, California on October 14th through the 16th, 2022. MFJ Enterprises, an amateur radio electronics manufacturer and retailer, will celebrate 50 years in business this October. With more details on the upcoming anniversary of MFJ, we go to John Ross, KD8 IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. Martin Jew, K5FUL, founded that company in 1972 after building a CW filter kit that sold for less than $10. Since 1990, the company has made five acquisitions, including high gain and Cushcraft antennas. MFJ customer service and public relations manager Richard Stubbs says the company continues to grow with the popularity of amateur radio and currently manufactures over 2,000 products. I've been with the company for 28 years, and the numbers are good, said Stubbs. Amateur radio continues to grow worldwide. Quite a few of MSJ's employees have worked there for years, such as MFJ product representative Phyllis Randall, who will be retiring in September after 45 years with the company. She started working there as a teenager in 1977, and she is now the product representative for all MFJ dealers. Jew himself graduated from uh, Mississippi State University with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, and he earned a master's degree in electrical engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology, also known as Georgia Tech. He served as a professor of electrical engineering at Mississippi State University from 1972 until 1979, but abandoned his doctorate in 1977 because of MFJ's growth. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Currently, because of COVID-19 concerns, the company does not have any plans for a special event to celebrate the anniversary, although Stubbs said that that may change in the months ahead. On August the 9th, 1922, a text was typed in an airplane and simultaneously printed out at a ground station. With this experiment, the U.S. Navy Department gave the teletype procedure wings a hundred years ago. From now on, it was possible to transmit text wirelessly at a speed of up to 100 words per minute. The ministry immediately pushed for messages to be made available in the opposite direction, namely from the ground to the plane. It was the birth of Radio Teleprinter, better known these days as RTTY. After the Second World War, the first RTTY machines came into the hands of radio amateurs in the USA, who then modified their transmitters for frequency shift keying. FSK switches between two or more audio tones to an agreed code for each keyboard character. RTTY had arrived in the amateur radio service. We amateurs call it RITI. With the advent of personal computers at the beginning of the 1980s, they replaced the previously widespread electromechanically generated signals with very simple RTTY programs. With the introduction of digital technology and the development of new types of transmission, such as PSK31 and later FT8, RITI has lost its previous importance in amateur radio, but it's still heavily used, especially in contests, because it is fast. It's different in the maritime radio service. Despite modern and fast digital processes, RTTY transmissions still have their place. For example, to warn of dangers or to transmit current sea weather reports to the skippers. If you go to www.loc.gov forward slash pictures, you can view an image in the Library of Congress, which shows the teleprinter radio used by the US Navy Department in August 1922 to receive typed radio messages from a naval aircraft. Thank you to Germany's DARC for this item. ARRL has unveiled its new radio laboratory, W1HQ, in a video released on August 4, 2022. In the video, Jerrica Goodgame, KI5HTA, a summer intern at ARRL headquarters, tours viewers through the station. With more on the new station on the air at League Headquarters and its laboratory functions, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report. The ARRL Radio Lab is an innovative test space designed to reshape the way we imagine and build a ham radio shack, said Good Game. 
The station is intended to inspire members to build, organize, and equip their own stations in innovative ways, from a decluttered workspace to a digital user interface to being able to remote into the equipment from anywhere. W1HQ is a step towards the future of amateur radio stations. The station includes a new tower and antennas atop the main administrative building at ARRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. Inside the station, three operating positions provide an interface to rack-mounted and computer-controlled transceivers, amplifiers, antenna switches, and rotators. The radio lab will also support equipment testing and QST product review. An extension of product reviews in the future will be able to take that piece of gear that we've been testing, put it on this test bench, and see how it integrates with a station that's already under full automation and control good game set. You can view the recently published video mentioned in this story on the ARRL's YouTube channel. On Monday, August 1st, the Federal Emergency Management Agency issued a public alert about certain vulnerabilities in the emergency alert system encoder and decoder device. FEMA said these vulnerabilities present a security concern, allowing outside actors to issue emergency alerts, whether it be via TV, radio, or cable network. In its public notice, FEMA encourages broadcasters and other EAS participants to check that their devices and supporting systems are up to date with the most recent software and security patch. The agency also asks participants to ensure that EAS devices are protected by a firewall and are monitored with audit logs regularly reviewed looking for unauthorized access. This exploit was successfully demonstrated by Ken Pyle, a security researcher at Cyber.com, and may be presented as proof of concept at an upcoming DEF CON conference in Las Vegas. In short, the vulnerability is public knowledge and will be demonstrated to a large audience in the coming weeks. Closing out its remarks, FEMA said it values its partnership with broadcasters and appreciates your efforts to maintain public trust and confidence on the emergency alert system. Radio Amateurs of Canada reports on July 28, 2022, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada released an update to a very important document for Canadian radio amateurs called RBR4, Standards for the Operation of Radio Stations in the Amateur Radio Service. For more on the new allocations released for Canadian amateurs, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report through the Southgate News Service in the UK. The document, called RBR4, Standards for the Operation of Radio Stations in the Amateur Radio Service, is an important one for Canadian hams. The full document specifies what frequencies radio amateurs may operate on and what power levels and bandwidths they may use. Crucially, in this release, there are two major new additions to the spectrum. Firstly, 472 to 479 kilohertz, also known as 630 meters, very low frequency in other words. On this band, Canadian amateurs are allowed to run a maximum of 5 watts EIRP, using emissions with a maximum bandwidth of 1 kHz. Secondly, there's a new chunk on the 60 meter band, 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz. This is in line with the new WARC worldwide allocation, but contains enhancements specific to Canada. Canadian amateurs are allowed to run a maximum of 100 watts ERP in this segment, using emissions with a maximum bandwidth of 2.8 kHz. This new 60 meter band chunk is in addition to radio amateurs' existing fixed frequency allocations at 5332, 5348, 5373 and 5405 kHz. The new 15 kHz wide allocation overlaps on the existing authority to use 5358.5 kHz. But Canadian amateurs are unique in having authority to use 100 watts ERP on the four spot frequencies and on the new 15 kHz worldwide segment. Amateurs in most countries are limited to 25 watts or less and may operate only in the new 15 kHz wide segment. Note that in Canada, amateur radio is a secondary radio service on these bands. Amateurs may not cause harmful interference to the primary users and may not claim protection from interference by primary users. Dave Goodwin, Victor Echo 3 Kilo Golf, is the Regulatory Affairs Officer for Radio Amateurs of Canada and tells us that you can find the full updated document and other supporting material by visiting www.rac.ca. There are other small changes listed in RBR4 that bring Canadian amateur radio regulations in line with changes agreed at several previous World Radio Conferences of the International Telecommunications Union. 
Radio Amateurs of Canada would like to thank former regulatory officer Richard Furch, VE3KI, for his dedicated work over several years to bring these changes forward. In the Lone Star State of Texas, USA, authorities cracked down after a handheld radio caused interference with emergency police transmissions. Mike Askins, Kilo Echo 5 Charlie X-Ray Pupper, said that it had been operating for months on emergency frequencies used by the Young County Sheriff's Office. According to local media reports, the transmissions on the dispatch channels often included the voices of a man, woman and some children yelling at each other and the sound of a barking dog. A story in the Olney Enterprise newspaper said that the police were so hampered in using their own assigned frequencies that they often had to use cell phones instead to communicate. Sheriff Travis Babcock contacted the Federal Communications Commission, the American Spectrum Regulator, which provided him with an official statement to read out on the emergency channel, but that failed to bring the transmissions to a halt. The news report said that on July the 8th, two officers patrolling in their car heard the unauthorized traffic and were able to track down the radio and its owner. It was not clear what charges would be filed against the owners of the radio, which is now the property of the county sheriff's office. Charges could range from a misdemeanor for interfering with public duty to a federal offence for interfering with emergency communications. Debris from a Russian anti-satellite weapon demonstration that caused squalls of close approaches to satellites earlier this year is now affecting a new series of Starlink satellites. During a presentation at a Secure World Foundation event during the Small Satellite Conference held on August 8th, Dan Altridge, chief scientist at Comspach, said his company found a conjunction squall affecting Starlink satellites, with a spike in the number of close approaches of debris from the former Cosmos 1408 satellite. That debris, created when a Russian direct ascent, ASAT destroyed Cosmos 1408 in a November 2021 test, is in an orbit that lines up with satellites in sun-synchronous orbit. Comspach found earlier this year that this created surges of close approaches, or conjunctions, as the satellites run head-on into the debris. In a recent event on August 6th, Outrage said there were more than 6,000 close approaches, defined as being within 10 kilometers, involving 841 Starlink satellites, about 30% of the constellation. It's unclear how many, if any, of the satellites had to maneuver to avoid collisions. This conjunction squall was exacerbated by a new group of Starlink satellites. SpaceX launched the first set of Group 3 Starlink satellites July 10th from Vandenberg Space Force Base into polar orbit, followed by a second set July 22nd. A third batch of Group 3 satellites is scheduled to launch this week. SpaceX has long emphasized the ability of its Starlink satellites to autonomously maneuver to avoid conjunctions. The company said that, between December 2021 and May 2022, Starlink satellites performed nearly 7,000 collision avoidance maneuvers, of which 1,700 were linked to Russian ASAT debris. While SpaceX may be able to manage these conjunctions with its technology, it may be more difficult for other operators of satellites' constellations. If you didn't have that automated system taking care of a spike like this, it could be really challenging to work it though, Atraj said. Those conjunction squalls will subside over time as the debris decays. However, Atraj said that may only shift the risk to other orbits, notably the International Space Station. It's going to put ISS and others at risk. Hampton University seeks to ensure that African Americans have access to educational opportunities in engineering and technology, as well as to inform the community of significant contributions made to the profession by African Americans and all ethnic minorities. More than 88% of Hampton University undergraduates receive some measure of financial assistance, which is why funding for unrestricted and current use scholarships is vital to keeping students on track to obtaining a high-quality education. The $200,000 grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications will provide scholarships to four students for one full academic year and assist with numerous gaps in tuition and associated costs of attending Hampton University. 
Hampton will introduce its students majoring in STEM-related fields to amateur radio and engage them through activities that provide unique, hands-on, experience-building opportunities. Additionally, the grant will fund hour-long educational programs highlighting scholars studying STEM topics that will be aired on Hampton's FM radio station, WHOV, on 88.1 MHz. The mission of the Hampton University's School of Engineering and Technology serves a segment of the U.S. population that has traditionally not had access to science and technology. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of internet communication. A new National Radio Astronomy Observatory program aims to educate emerging generations about the electromagnetic spectrum through an interactive, substantive experience with amateur radio. Funded by a grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications, ARDC, the program exploring the electromagnetic spectrum and why amateur radio matters will focus on broadening the excitement of amateur radio among BIPOC and LGBTQIA students. Bringing together the expertise of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, amateur radio enthusiasts, and subject matter experts, the two-year program will introduce two cohorts of students to radio technologies, engage these students in hands-on activities that will deepen their knowledge of astronomy, particularly radio astronomy, support them in attaining their technician class and general class amateur radio licenses, and develop a scalable curriculum to be shared nationwide and internationally through Supernova, NRAO's online learning platform. Students will learn about the very real ways in which the electromagnetic spectrum is a natural resource, every bit as limited and precious as the oceans and forests. They will also learn how amateur radio is an essential part of our national emergency infrastructure and a critical resource in times of climate change and pandemics. The program is expected to start January 2023, initially serving 10 students. According to Dr. Tony Beasley, director of the NRAO, amateur radio continues to be incredibly important to the nation and global communications, and NRAO is excited to be working with ARDC to bring a new generation and diverse communities to the field. The National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO, is a facility of the National Science Foundation operated under cooperative agreement by Associated Universities Incorporated. Furthering the National Science Foundation's mission to advance the progress of science, the NRAO enables research into the universe at radio wavelengths and provides world-class telescopes, instrumentation, and expertise to the scientific community. NRAO's mission includes a commitment to broader, equitable, inclusive participation in science and engineering, training the next generation of scientists and engineers, and promoting astronomy to foster a more scientifically literate society. NRAO operates three research facilities, the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array, the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array and the Very Long Baseline Array, which are available for use by scientists from around the globe, regardless of institutional or national affiliation. The NRAO welcomes applicants who bring diverse and innovative dimensions to the observatory and to the field of radio astronomy. For more information about NRAO, go to public.nrao.edu. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of Internet communications. Hi, the antenna's full line of HF Directive Receiving Array products will now be designed and manufactured by DX Engineering. Hi, z CEO, Founder, and Chief Engineer Lee Strahan, K7TJR, said... The time has come for me to pass along IZ's antennas technology to DX Engineering. It's my wish they will usher in a new pinnacle of performance as they carry forward HiZ's latest designs and ideas. It's great to know that HiZ will be in such capable hands. Strahan became interested in low band operating more than 20 years ago after reaching Japan on 160 meters while contesting. He began building array systems for personal use. But after publishing one of his designs on the internet, 
he drew the attention to like-minded items. Since then, hi -Z's singular focus has been producing and refining receiving systems that deliver reduced noise, superb weak signal HF reception, and reliable performance, especially for 160 and 80 meters, and AM DXing. DX Engineering has been the exclusive dealer of the hi -Z equipment since 2013. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Let's see, what happened this week? What's been going on? I always have to, it's hard for me, you know, I do, um, I do podcasts all week about tech, and it's hard to, for me to remember what we've talked about and what we haven't. Remind me. Did we talk about the Hellabyte? Okay, now you gotta understand, I'm in California, and, uh, this is a very California crusade by a, um, a former physics student, Austin Sendek, uh, UC Davis, who started a campaign. Now, you may know, you probably do know, about the different designations for, for bytes. There's, you know, a byte is eight bits. That's one in a computer. A bit is an on or off, one or zero. So eight ones or zeros makes a byte that can represent... 256 different states and it's usually what's used to represent a letter in the alphabet uppercase lowercase numbers punctuation they all fit within a byte uh when you get a thousand of those bytes we use uh i guess it's the greek word for thousand kilo kilobyte it's like kilometer right a kilobyte then a a, a thousand kilobytes is a megabyte you've heard these right mega thousand Actually, mega's million, right? Mega millions. Isn't that a, that's a lottery thing in California? Mega million. So mega. Mega's a million of something, a million bytes. Then there's, after megabyte, there's a gigabyte. Meg, gig. It actually, it, it actually goes on. You don't really often, you hear terabyte for a hard drive, right? So, uh, and then after that, you know, it kind of falls off the edge of the earth. Except, no, there are more of them. There are many more of them. After a, after gigabyte, terabyte, then a thousand terabytes, which is, uh, let's see, a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes, which is a thousand megabytes. So megabytes, uh, a, a million, gigabytes, a billion, terabytes, a trillion, petabyte would be, what, a quadrillion. There's another word you don't hear a lot about. Then there's, after petabyte, there's some more. There's exabyte. It's a thousand petabytes. There's zettabyte. It's actually, you know, I'm probably confusing things. A thousand is a decimal, and really we're, we should be talking in uh, a binary, so it's a thousand twenty-four. But anyway, you get the idea. Zettabyte, and then finally yottabyte, which is one thousand twenty-four to the eighth bits. <laughs> a yada. These are all. They all come from uh, Greek. It's called the International System of Quantities. And it is, there is, there's the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC, which publishes these standards and so forth. But we've stopped. We stopped at Yadabyte. We don't have anything past a Yadabyte. And, you, you know, you don't want to talk about a million Yadabytes or a billion Yadabytes. I guess you could. It doesn't come up that much. But this guy, uh, Austin Sendak, 10 years ago, proposed that after Yadabyte, we'd have Hellabyte. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, you know, we're eventually we're going to get there. We're going to get there because, you know, there's more and more things in the world. In fact, Google, if you search for something like bytes to helibytes, actually has a calculator, a conversion widget that will convert. They, they, they've kind of signed up. Sendak is now at Stanford. He's a software company CEO. Wolfram Alpha has Hella calculations. <laughs> now, maybe if you're not from California, you don't remember or don't know that Hella it was was commonly used. It's kind of Valley Girl speak. Oh, that's Hella awesome. That kind of thing. Unfortunately, there are other proposals for what comes after a Yada bite. There's also a Bronto bite, like Brontosaurus. This has not yet been resolved. I might add, it's still up in the air. Hella bite could still win. There's Rana bite. R O N N A. These actually, that's that's kind of the the leader at this point. I don't know why. Ten to the twenty seventh, and Keta or Queta, Q U E T T A byte. That's what's currently being considered. Queta byte is ten to the thirtieth. Rona byte, 
Aranabite is 10 to the 27. I like Hella and Bronto myself. <laughs> Don't you? Uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention this because it's not yet decided. Write a letter to your, I don't know who, the IEC, I guess, your member of Congress and say, we want hell. Hell of bites useful. The mass of the sun, for instance, you could say, you know, is 2,200 yada tons, but it's actually which 2.2 helitons, which is better, right? The sun is 2.2 helitons. Instead of 300 yada watts, it releases yada watts. It releases 0.3 helawatts. I like that. <laughs> Somebody is in the chat room saying, "You know, lot of bytes is still available too." <laughs> I think at some point you just go one, two, three, many. Yeah, the number of atoms in 12 kilograms of carbon 12 is 0.6 hell atoms. Hella atoms. I like it. I don't know. Just thought I'd bring that up. Just thought maybe you'd want to weigh in on that to write your member of the IEC. Say, Bronto is good. Hella is good. Rana and Quetta. I don't. That sounds like a girl's names. I don't know. I don't, I don't understand the value of that. I don't know where they're going with that. But that's currently the front runner. So let's get involved here. Let's stop this entirely. Speaking of science, I'm... I'm Really glad to see that President Joe Biden is going to make the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy a cabinet level agency, which means science will have a seat at the cabinet table. I think that's fantastic. He selected uh, a geneticist or nominated a geneticist, Eric Lander. He's a mathematician and geneticist. He helped map the human genome and uh, he's the head of the Broad Institute of Boston based biomedical research center famous for its work on CRISPR the gene editing technology also a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Harvard Medical School don't you hate these overachievers we well, just pick one job just do one anyway a good person to head this up I'm so glad the office the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy this is something I and many of my geek friends have been lobbying for because right now neither Congress nor the White House really has the information I think they need to deal with the modern issues today we're facing in science and technology. It's not, you know, it's fine. I mean, I wouldn't expect uh, our, our leaders to be scientists necessarily, but I love it that science has a seat at the table. I was really happy to see that. That's good news. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1963. The ARRL, responding to some complaints about generals being allowed on 75 and 20 meter phone, proposes an incentive licensing system. Under the ARRL proposal, generals and conditionals would lose 75, 40, 20, and 15 meter phone privileges over a two year period. Also in 1963, the Building Fund to construct the ARRL headquarters at 225 Main Street, Newington, is in full swing. The amateur population is over 200,000, but CB licenses now outnumber hams. 1964. A ham in the White House? Barry Goldwater, K7UGA and K3UIG, is the Republican candidate for president. He is defeated. Herbert Hoover dies at the age of 90. As Secretary of Commerce in the 1920s and President of the United States from 1929 to 1933, his strong support of amateur radio was invaluable. He lived long enough to see his son, Herbert Hoover Jr., W6ZH, elected President of the ARRL. 1965. The FCC comes out with its own incentive licensing proposal. 
general and conditional class operators would lose 50% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands. A new amateur first class license with a 16 word per minute code speed would be the stepping stone between the general and the extra. Advanced class amateurs would not be grandfathered into the first class. Rather, they would be bumped down to general upon renewal. Oscar III and Oscar IV allowed two-way QSOs via satellite. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. The International Amateur Radio Union invited amateurs to come up with a game-changing idea which could lead to more licensed radio amateurs. They've now announced the results. It was on April the 30th that the first edition of IARU Region 1 Hand Challenge was announced, which is an initiative to bring new ideas to the amateur radio community. After careful consideration and review of all the participants' proposals, in addition to having an interview with them to present their ideas, the judging committee has come to a final decision. The top prize goes to Nestor 5 Bravo 4 Alpha Hotel Zulu from Cyprus and Christian Hotel Bravo 9 Foxtrot Echo Uniform from Switzerland in equal first place. Nestor presented his ham radio escape room project. The idea came to him during the COVID-19 crisis when people needed to find a way to have fun remotely while actual physical escape rooms were closed. The radio-based escape room can be played in a very similar way to a virtual escape room with amateur radio themes and stories where teams playing the game can also communicate via radio rather than a webcam. Christian presented a public database of fun projects for innovation, a public database of new ideas for technology-orientated hobbyists with little or no radio experience or equipment. Each project description includes an indication of the level of complexity and the required time needed, prerequisite knowledge, required equipment, and so on. Both projects received the acclaim of the IARU Region 1 Executive Committee and warm thanks for their involvement in amateur radio future activities. The third place goes to Luca, India Uniform 2 Foxtrot Romeo Lima and his team from Italy for their Urgent Sat project, describing a simple case of equipment that can be transported to schools or public demonstrations and provide a brief demonstration of the incredible capabilities of the ham radio world, particularly how using cheap and second-hand gear can achieve reliable communications over great distances. Their demonstration system uses the QO100 satellite, a geostationary device with massive ground coverage capable of repeating voice as well as both wideband and narrowband digital streams, which includes high quality video signals. This project combines many scientific disciplines, creating an interesting environment to introduce new users to communication technologies at any level. Guy Zulu Sierra 6 Golf Uniform Yankee wins the Youth Prize for a workbook that will showcase various aspects of the amateur radio hobby. The proposed workbook is designed to help newcomers by increasing their knowledge of different aspects of our hobby and this workbook could become a vital tool for mentors to teach about some of the most common amateur radio activities. The IARU Region 1 Executive Committee looks forward to preparing the second edition of the Ham Challenge in 2023, but in the meantime, they are in touch with the recent winners to provide them with further assistance to bring their projects into reality. You can read more on the IARU Region 1 website, www.iaru-r1.org. A couple of good stories this past week were aired by local news organizations. Fox 40, WIZC TV in New York recently aired a story that featured students at the Kopernik Observatory and Science Center talking to astronauts aboard the International Space Station. The Binghamton Amateur Radio Association and ARRL affiliated club helped set up that contact. And in the United Kingdom, in Broadstairs on the Isle of Thanet, a local newspaper ran a story about Isabella Payne, an eight-year-old who was also able to talk to astronauts aboard the International Space Station. Her dad, Matthew, an amateur radio operator, and the Hillerstone Radio Society helped made that contact possible. A Brooklyn, New York marketer of wireless microphones has been fined nearly $700,000 by the U.S. Federal Communications Commission for what the agency said is a decade-long practice of selling these devices, which are not RF compliant. 
The FCC said that 32 microphones sold by SoundAround failed to comply with FCC requirements governing emissions power and use of the spectrum and rules that protect against harmful interference to other spectrum users. The commission has rejected the business's assertion that the dollar amount of the proposed fine was too high that a decade of warnings and notices sent by the FCC was insufficient, and that photos of the company's marketing websites did not provide proof that the item was available for purchase. According to a press release from the FCC, the U.S. Department of Justice will be given the case to handle if SoundAround fails to pay the fine. The Hancock Oxcom team in Chester, West Virginia is again hosting the annual Teapot Day special event station. Using the call signs W1T, K2T, W3T, W4T, W5T, W6T, W7T, W8T, W9T, W0T, and WV8HAT. That event is currently in operation through August 14th, and it celebrates the world's largest teapot. Before finding its home in Chester, which was once known as the pottery capital of the world, that giant teapot started out as a root beer stand and then became a clubhouse for a miniature golf course in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. It was moved to Chester in 1938 and served as a roadside attraction for a local pottery company. The Teapot Day Special Event Station has been held for six years. Operators will be eligible for a certificate by contacting one or all of the stations. The event also includes endorsements for bonus stations and a clean sweep. More information is available at the Hancock Oxcom team website, or you can use the ARRL Special Event Station's listings to find other on-air events. Alan Pennington, writing on the BDXC Club News Group, tells us that Carillon Wellbeing Radio, based in Colville, Leicestershire, will again relay a broadcast from the LV18 Lightship moored in Harwich. The trustees of Light Vessel 18 say that it is with great excitement that they announce the radio broadcasts, taking place on Saturday the 13th and Sunday the 14th of August 2022. Broadcasting will be live online at carillonradio.com and in some areas on 1476 kHz AM in the medium wave band. Similarly to last year, the broadcasting will be 24-7 across the weekend, with a variety of DJs, including a Sunday show by Stephen Foster, who was formerly a presenter on BBC Suffolk and now a regular Radio Caroline presenter. There will also be two shows by veteran DJ Keith Skews. Both shows will be broadcast live from the LV18. Keith will also be around for a meet and greet and a book signing from about 11am till 1pm on the Sunday. As the LV18 Lightship is a charity, admission will be charged at £4 for adults, £2 for children under 16 and £10 for families. The LV18's postcode is charlieoscar123 Hotel Hotel and organisers say it would be great to see as many people as possible. The schedule on Carillon Wellbeing Radio's website shows programmes from the LV18 actually starting at 8pm local time, Friday the 12th. Take a look at carillonradio.com forward slash schedule for more detail. The transmission on 1476 kilohertz can be well heard after dark in the UK and even Europe. Foundations of Amateur Radio One of the most misunderstood settings on your radio is the microphone gain. You'll often hear people talking about adjusting it up or down depending on what they hear and the results are often displeasing to the ear. The very first thing to know is that the microphone gain is likely the single most audible setting on your radio, right after the tuning frequency. It's pretty much the first variable between your voice and your transmitter. Set it too low and you'll hear nothing. Set it too high and you'll hear gibberish. I said it's pretty much the first thing, but it's not the very first. That's your voice, unique in all its glory. Loud, soft, happy, sad, funny or not, it's the thing that your microphone captures to transmit. Closely coupled to your voice is the distance between your mouth and your mic. The closer you are, the louder the further, the softer, and the more background noise creeps in. As an aside, speaking of noise, there's background noise at play, but there's also the noise that comes from the audio circuitry itself, which can, for example, change depending on the temperature of your radio. I'm going to refer to both as noise here, even though they're slightly different. So, starting with the ideal model, where you always speak in the same way, at the same volume, at the same distance from the microphone, with a constant temperature in your radio, at all times, the next thing is the microphone gain, or gain. 
Gain is an imperfect attempt at corralling your utterings into electrical signals without causing the audio circuit to distort or drown in noise. Distortion comes as a result of overloading the audio circuit when the gain is too high, causing clipping, which essentially changes the audio waveform into something that no longer resembles your voice. At the low end of the gain range, there is no difference between audio and noise, which results in your voice being buried inside a hissing noise. You might wonder why we don't just build transmitters that cannot clip and increase your volume. Well, we do. We use things like AGC, or Automatic Gain Control, to attempt to prevent such things from happening, but this isn't perfect. All this results in the microphone gain being a setting that you need to tune to your voice and adjust as things change. Overall, the best outcome is when you set the gain so the AGC just engages when you talk normally. This gain setting also applies to computer-generated signals, often fed into your radio via an audio or microphone input. If you set the gain too low, noise is the problem. Set it too high, and the automatic gain control will distort the signal to the point where it no longer works, and causes interference for everyone else, including the station that you're trying to contact. On older radios, the output power was fixed. This is also true for software-defined radios. To reduce output power, you can change the microphone gain down and reduce the power. Change it to halfway and your output power is essentially reduced to half power. This works for a range of settings, but get too low and we're back to noise and audio fighting each other. The opposite isn't true. You cannot increase the microphone gain to increase power. The moment you exceed the audio circuit range, your signal is distorted. On an SDR, this means that you're exceeding the ability of the analog to digital converter to represent your audio. In digital terms, zero means no sound, and all on means 100%. If your audio is so loud as to only be 100% on, that's like sending a tone out the transmitter, resembling anything but your voice. All of what I've talked about is related to SSB signals, and to some extent AM. FM is a different animal entirely. For starters, output power on FM is fixed. The next difference is the signal or channel width. Without going into full detail, FM comes in different widths. WFM or wideband FM, NFM or narrowband FM, and between the two, normal FM. To make things more fun, not everyone agrees on what each one means at any given time. Also, channel width and channel spacing are not the same thing, but that's for another day. Gain aside for a moment, consider two matched FM radios using the same channel width. Your voice volume is determined by how much of the channel you use. Louder means wider, softer means narrower. Adjust the gain up, the signal gets wider, but the limit of the channel width remains. Get too high and it clips at the channel width and distorts. At the other end, changing the gain down, you'll use less of the channel width and eventually the noise and your voice will be at the same level and you won't be heard. Let's look at what happens when you use a normal FM signal to transmit to a narrowband FM receiver. Essentially, your signal is too wide, and the result is that your voice will be clipped, unless you speak really softly, or if you set the gain really low. Either way, it comes with more noise. Similarly, if you transmit a narrowband FM signal to a normal FM receiver, then your voice will be very low regardless of the microphone gain setting, and turning it up will only distort it due to clipping inside your transmitter. So for FM, before fiddling with the gain, make sure that you're using the same FM mode as the other station. One thing to remember is that when you use a repeater, if the audio is always too loud for everyone, your mode is probably too narrow. Similarly, if the audio is always too soft and you always need to turn up the volume on your radio, your mode is likely too wide. Check your radio specifications to determine what each mode means. In broadcast audio, this whole thing is managed by calibration using standard tones, but as amateurs, we tend to rely on other people reporting their feelings on the quality of your voice, with the often heard admonishment to adjust the microphone gain. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Here is this week's AMSAT update from Roots Page, KK5DO. John K. D2BD has released a version of 2.3.0 of Predict software 
Predict is a satellite tracking and orbital prediction application for Linux, Unix, PC, laptops, Raspberry Pis, and Android devices running under the Termux environment. There is also a limited capability version that runs under a 32-bit environment. If you've not heard of Predict, it's what drives the AMSAT pass predictions online as well as used by NASA for tracking data for the VLBI radio telescope steering. It's used by ESA's Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, where it provides tracking and velocity to steer the 25 millimeter, 25 meter rather, dish antenna at the Chobolton Observatory. If you're interested in the software, you can download it from their website, https www.qsl.net, kd2b slash predict.html. Thanks, John, for a great open source software. You can also find that website at the ARRL letter and on the ARRL.org website. If you're looking for a few new border grids, Ryan KI7QEX will be vacationing in British Columbia and Alberta. He will operate holiday style from DN09, DO00, DO01, DO11, DO20, DO21, and that's from August 25th through September 3rd. And just a quick reminder, if you're planning on attending the AMSAT Symposium in October, the link to the hotel room and reservations is at their website, amsat.org. Failure and disappointment mark the debut of India's small satellite launch vehicle, which lifted off on Saturday, August 6th, only to deploy two satellites into the wrong orbits. According to Space.com, one of the satellites was a much-anticipated project built by 750 schoolgirls in India as part of Space Kids India. It carried an amateur radio payload. The Indian Space Agency said that the satellites were sent into an elliptical orbit instead of the intended circular orbit 356 kilometers or 222 miles above the Earth. The elliptical orbit meant that at some point the satellite's orbits would come as close to Earth as 76 kilometers or 47 miles. Officials from ISRO said the error was caused by a sensor failure that could not be detected in time. Five hours after liftoff, the mission was declared a failure. The maiden voyage of the launcher was a much-celebrated event which also commemorated India's 75th year of independence. This year's 10th Youngsters on the Air Summer Camp is taking place now in Croatia through August 13th, 2022. Attending from the Americans is Miley Azaro, YS1YXI from El Salvador, along with her father Juan, who is participating as a team leader. Participants are publishing a daily blog from that camp, and you can read it at www.ham-yoda.com. It's time to take a quick look at this week's propagation forecast report, brought to us as always by Ted Cook, K7RA in Seattle, Washington, who reports that this week's solar activity did a rebound this week to more active levels. The average daily sunspot number increased from 36.6 to 65.4, and the average daily 10.7 centimeter solar flux rose from 95.7 to 111.9. Solar wind caused geomagnetic numbers to rise, with the average planetary A index going from 7.7 .7 to 14.4, and middle latitude numbers from 8.6 to 12.1. An improved outlook shows solar flux peaking at 116 on September 2nd through the 4th. A look at previous propagation reports going back to 2021 gives a perspective on solar cycle progress. A year ago, the average sunspot number was 6, and the average solar flux was just 74.8, quite a difference from 65.4 and 111.9 during the past week. So taking a look ahead, the predicted flux values are 105 on August 13th, 108 on August 14th, 110 on August 15th through the 18th, 104 on August 19th through the 21st, and 98, 100, 102, 100, 102, and 100 once again on August 22nd through the 27th. And a quick look at the predicted planetary A and dice, and that will be 8 on August 13th, 5 on August 14th through the 17th, 8 and 15 on August 18th and 19th, 8 on August 20th and 21st, 5 on August 22nd through the 26th, and 12 on August 27th. 
The National Science Foundation in America has awarded a grant of nearly $400,000 to radio amateur Nathan Arl Frisell, Whiskey 2 November Alpha Foxtrot, Assistant Professor of Physics and Electrical Engineering at the University of Scranton. Dr. Frisell will lead a collaborative research project entitled Measuring Daily Ionospheric Variability and the 2023-24 Solar Eclipse Ionospheric Impacts using HAM SCI HF Doppler Shift Receivers. In other words, examining the ionosphere moment by moment using shortwave frequencies. As the lead investigator, Dr. Frisell will work with students at the University of Scranton, collaborators at Case Western Reserve University, and amateur radio volunteers across the USA to study how dawn, dusk, and solar eclipses affect the electrified portion of the upper atmosphere, known as the ionosphere. This will be done using a network of satellites in the Global Navigation Satellite System, working to synchronize high-frequency receivers on the ground, known as GRAPES. These devices have already been developed as part of a $1.3 million HAM SCI Personal Space Weather Station project, the grant for which was awarded in 2019. An annular solar eclipse will take place on October the 14th, 2023, and a total solar eclipse will take place on April the 8th, 2024. Dr. Frisell said that these are the last solar eclipses to traverse the continental United States until 2044 and are therefore important, time-sensitive, information-rich opportunities for running unique and controlled ionospheric experiments. This project will take advantage of the unprecedented opportunity to study the ionospheric impacts of the 2023 and 2024 solar eclipses and the daily ionospheric variability associated with dawn and dusk transitions directly within the ionosphere itself. This will lead to a better understanding of the impact of ionospheric disturbances and its imperative because these changes can affect crucial navigation and communication systems. According to Dr. Frisell, this new NSF grant will fund an additional 30 great receivers that will be deployed throughout North America. Volunteers from the HAM SCI amateur radio community will be able to fund and field additional stations. All stations will run continuously from deployment through to at least the end of the project in 2025 and will capture the 2023 and 2024 eclipses. The grant will also support master's and PhD level student participation in the research data collection and analysis. The project will also establish a new network of measurement instruments that, due to their low cost and operation by volunteers, has the potential to provide measurements for years to come. The results of the project will be shared widely with the amateur radio community through presentations at amateur radio conventions, local clubs and publication in amateur radio magazines and journals. In addition, Dr. Frisell was awarded a highly competitive five-year $616,000 NSF grant in 2020 to apply sophisticated physics-based atmospheric and ionospheric models to extensive data sets collected through the international network of ham radio operators. Dr. Frisell joined the faculty at Scranton in the autumn of 2019. He earned a doctorate and a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Virginia Tech in Blacksburg and a bachelor's degree in physics and music education from Montclair State University in New Jersey. He is the founder and lead organizer of the International Citizen Science Space Physics Research Collective, known as the HAM Radio Science Citizen Investigation, more easily remembered as HAM SCI. HAM SCI is recognized as an official NASA citizen science project. And of course, he's a radio amateur. There's lots more about this fascinating project at news.scranton.edu. Amateurs in France will need to share many of their frequencies with broadcasters and others involved in the upcoming Paris 2024 Olympic Games. Just as some amateur frequencies were open to other users during the Olympics in London in 2012, amateur frequencies are to be shared during the 2024 Olympics in France. According to recent news reports, some VHF and UHF frequencies are to become available between June 26th and September 15th of 2024 to accommodate the organizing committee for the Paris Games, thus requiring amateur radio operators to limit their activities on those bands. The National Frequency Agency of France 
which is responsible for allocations in that country, said frequencies are being made available during the games for private mobile voice communications, mostly by walkie-talkie. Amateur radio operators are considered primary users on two meters by International Telecommunications Union. On other bands, 1240 MHz to 1260 MHz will be used for program making and special events, or PMSE services. These frequencies are open to hams on a secondary basis. Frequencies in the 2.3 GHz band, also open to hams on a secondary basis, will be used for video links. Going on the air as D2TX from Angola as a portable Earth-Moon Earth operator is expected to be an unprecedented experience. Bernie ZS4TX said that he is unaware of any of the popular EME bands having been used to activate Angola as he is doing on 2 meters between the 12th and 16th of August. It's a long road trip, more than 2,800 kilometers over the course of four days. The final 220 kilometers is on dirt roads and will take six hours. Bernie said the advantage is road travel means the station will be able to use larger than usual array of 2x18 element M2 Yagi antennas. Bernie also said that stations with 12 element Yagi, 250 watts, and a decent low noise amplifier can likely work him, and that recent developments in digital modes available from WSJTX may make it possible for even the most modest stations. With a couple of moon passes, Bernie hopes to be able to work 300 or so stations. Licensed since the age of 17, Bernie learned about 2 meter EME from Hal, ZS6, WB, and Chris, ZS6, EZ, in the early 90s when he and Chris worked Dave, W5, UN, on CW EME from Botswana during a VHF expedition trip. He later worked W5, UN from Lesotho for one of his last entities for the first 2 meter DXCC award ever issued. Bernie urges EME enthusiasts to listen for him. He went on to say that operators should use this opportunity. It may be a very long time before Angola is activated again. It could be the chance of a lifetime. You can find helpful information on setting up a station and working EME on W7GJ's website. Norway's Telen newspaper recently reported on a new regional emergency response centre at Notterden in the south of Norway near Oslo. The newspaper's journalist visited a new regional emergency response centre in the city and met with the radio amateurs from a local group that have been cooperating with the local government and was shown around the centre as well as observing a suitcase fitted with mobile communication equipment that will be deployed from the centre. This is an important initiative and matches what several other radio amateur groups have done. The Norwegian National Society, NRRL, has been working with government councillors and the local mayor in Notterdam, and this successful collaboration suggests that similar initiatives could follow in other parts of Norway. The agreement essentially has two main goals. Firstly, it emphasises the importance for the municipality of having a vibrant radio amateur community in the region, and it is hoped that this will be supported by the municipality through a positive attitude to the processing of licence applications and permits. Secondly, it's a great step forward to having a hub established for the NRRL liaison and emergency services in the region. The equipment suitcase that was on display is part of this collaboration, permanently placed in the Regional Emergency Centre, which is part of the Regional Fire Station. Notterden Municipality has also made available a location for a crossband repeater and contributed to the planning, electrical supply and infrastructure for this. In this way, eastern parts of the Telemark region are now connected into the repeater network. Kai Lima Bravo 4 Oscar Alpha, together with Tord Lima Alpha 7 Mike Hotel Alpha, are the key personnel managing the network. This forms part of future agreements between state administrators and all NRRL radio amateur radio groups in the country. Work is now continuing to strengthen amateur radio emergency networks across much more of Norway, and a new UHF repeater on a mountain in the Telemark region is already serving western parts of Norway. In several other areas, local government has been taking the lead in formal cooperation to strengthen and develop on the example of amateur radio communities in the Telemark region, ready to serve in times of emergency. For more information and photographs, go to tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Norway.
Just ahead in radio sport contesting, a lot of great opportunities coming up. On August 12th, it's the QRP Fox Hunt, that is CW. August 12th through the 14th, it's the MMON VHF Dubus 144 megahertz Meteor Scour Sprint Contest, that's CW Phone and Digital. Also, August 13th through the 14th, the KCC SKCC Weekend Sprintathon, that's CW. August 13th, the Kentucky State Parks on the Air, CW Phone and Digital. And August 13th and 14th, there's uh, two events, Maryland DC QSO Party, CW Phone Digital, and the 50 megahertz fall, fall sprint, that's CW Phone and Digital as well. August 15th, the Four States QRP Group Second Sunday Sprint, CW and Phone. On August 16th, the Worldwide Sideband Activity Contest, that's Phone. August 17th, the Phone Weekly Test, also Phone there. August 17th, the VHF UHF FT8 Activity Contest, that's FT8. And on August 18th through the 19th, it's the Walk for the Bacon QRP Contest, that's CW. And here are some upcoming section state and vision conventions to be aware of. On August 13th, it's the Tidewater Ham Fest and Swap Meet hosting the ARRL Virginia State Convention. That's in Portsmouth, Virginia. And August 20th through the 21st, the Huntsville Ham Fest hosting the ARRL Southeastern Division Convention in Huntsville, Alabama. August 25th through the 28th, the Northeast Ham Exposition hosting the ARRL New England and Hudson Division Conventions. That's in Marlboro, Massachusetts. September 2nd through the 4th, the Shelby Ham Fest hosting the ARRL North Carolina Section Convention. That's in Shelby, North Carolina. September 11th, the ARRL Southern New Jersey Section Convention. That's in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. And on September 17th through 18th, it's the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. That's an online event. ARRL is a QSO Today partner. The U.S. Federal Communications Commission is looking at how it can help kickstart manufacturing in space, but said orbital debris needs to be addressed first. In a meeting held August 5th, the FCC voted unanimously to open proceedings on in-space servicing, assembly and manufacturing, or ISAM, to examine what sort of opportunities and challenges would be created by moving some industrial processes above Earth. ISAM, the agency said in a statement, has the potential to build entire industries, creating new jobs, mitigate climate change, and advance America's economic, scientific, technological, and national security interests. The FCC Notice of Inquiry will look into uses of ISAM, including in-flight satellite refueling, inspections and repairs of orbital spacecraft, transforming materials through manufacturing while in space, and debris removal, something the FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel said is essential to promoting safety and responsibility in space. There are thousands of metric tons of junk in space that if left unaddressed will constrain those new opportunities in the skies above and ISAM could help improve this environment, Rosenworcel said in a statement. Some debris stands to be a serious impediment to orbital activity in the very near future. Millions of chunks of different sizes are whizzing around Earth, and even the smallest have the potential to cause catastrophic damage to other spacecraft. According to NASA, debris in Earth orbit travels at speeds of up to 17,500 miles per hour. The agency notes that objects as small and fragile as paint flecks have had enough force behind them to damage space shuttle windows. In fact, millimeter-sized orbital debris represents the highest mission-ending risk to most robotic spacecraft operating in low Earth orbit, NASA said. The FCC's role in space rulemaking involves anything to do with communications from space to ground sites in the U.S., including making rules to help satellites avoid damage due to orbital debris. Earlier last week, the FCC freed up additional spectrum in the 17 gigahertz band to support the growing demand for space-based services and is working to clear a path for satellites to operate in the 50.4 to 51.4 gigahertz range, Rosen Russell said. Additionally, the FCC division responsible for satellite matters has had its headcount increased by 38% to keep up with it all, Rosen Russell added. 
No one imagined commercial space tourism taking hold. No one believed crowd-funded satellites and mega constellations at low Earth orbit were possible. And no one could have conceived of the sheer popularity of space entrepreneurship. But it's all happening, Rosenworcel said. The Holmesburg Amateur Radio Club in Philadelphia decided to send its club call, WM3PEN, on a long vacation that would take 255 days to get there. They teamed up with NASA's Mars Science Laboratory rover Curiosity to visit Bradbury Landing on Mars. The boarding pass was purchased on April 25, 2011, and Curiosity, with their call sign on board, landed on the Red Planet in early August 2012. Since the landing, Curiosity and WM3PEN have traveled nearly 18 miles searching for the perfect location for the de-expedition. The folks at WM3PEN also thought it would be a good trip to team up with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory since they decided to make it a CW event. To help measure size and distance, the JPL engineers carved out the dots and dashes of the letters JPL in the tire treads. How could a ham argue with a CW buddy along for the ride? NASA reports that engineers are devising ways to minimize wear and tear and keep their rover rolling. In fact, Curiosity's mission was recently extended for another three years. When asked what's next for the WM3PEN team, callsign trustee Bob Josuate, WA3PZO, said that after just coming off field day, and the 13 Colonies special event in June and July, it will be time to relax before planning the next adventure. As an aside, most of the news anchors and behind-the-scenes folks here at This Week in Amateur Radio also have their names and call signs on the Curiosity rover, as well as the Parker Solar Probe. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In the last three segments on the subject of pr promoting your ham radio club's event, we covered making a successful public service announcement. In this segment, we'll look into where to send your PSA once it's ready to mail. I'm always collecting addresses for local media outlets. No matter how long I've looked, I'm always finding new places to get free advertising for our local ham radio clubs. In the library, or at most radio stations' business offices, you can find a thick paperback book called The M Street Directory. This is a good reference for names, fax numbers, and addresses of radio stations in North America. Most states have a broadcaster association, and books of addresses and other contact information. Engineering firms who provide technical services to the broadcast industry also keep these books and would no doubt let you copy the pages to begin your collection of local media outlets. For your club's fundraising promotion, I would suggest posting notes in grocery stores, laundromats, schools, libraries, the nearest National Weather Service office, and neighborhood bulletin boards. Mail copies of your PSA to all local radio stations, TV stations, cable TV offices, newspapers, technical vocational schools, on-campus radio and TV stations, and even the local Radio Shack store. As an extra incentive, when you mail your PSA to your local radio and TV stations, include several complimentary admission tickets for the station to use as they see fit with no strings attached. This both allows them to give them away to listeners or offer them to station staff who may also someday become hams and join your ham radio club. If your local radio station is truly active in the community, you can invite them to broadcast live from your event if they want to. They can do this with minimal cost and equipment, sometimes requiring nothing more than a cell phone and a station logo on a banner. So always be looking for new ways to promote your club's fundraiser. In my opinion, in today's computer automated world, the more you automate, the more you mail, the more you collect addresses, the easier and faster you can promote next year's event. Over a period of years, with good record keeping, you can turn promotion to a matter of updating last year's PSA 
which is still stored in your computer, with the correct date, printing new flyers and PSAs, new address labels, and within 30 minutes, the entire effort can often be a few keystrokes and mouse clicks away from completion. This is Greg Stoddard reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Omcom News in India has been reporting on the public service activities of the West Bengal Radio Club. Recently, two families, one from West Bengal and the other from Uttar Pradesh, were reunited with missing family members, thanks to the efforts of the West Bengal Radio Club, an organisation of ham radio enthusiasts who have been carrying out this mission of reuniting families with people roaming on the streets as vagabonds. Over several years, hundreds of people have been reunited with their families, thanks to the vast network of the Amateur Radio Club. Even government departments now seek help from these ham radio operators to locate families of missing and displaced people, some languishing in hospitals and shelter homes for years. Amateur radio is a hobby which requires a license in India, and hams normally operate within their own network. However, it is slightly different in the case of the West Bengal Radio Club. This organisation has been assigned by both the central and state governments to provide connectivity during natural disasters or large events. The hams from WBRC also operated during the devastating Nepal earthquake and were among the first to create communications links from the disaster sites. While working at such sites, WBRC members realised that there are thousands of people who have become displaced or lost and are in need of being reunited with their families. Their service is voluntary. You can read the full story at omcomnews.com and if you would like to find out more about the West Bengal Radio Club, have a look at www.wbrc.in. As many as nine new amateur radio stations are being set up by the government of Tripura in India in an attempt to improve communications during disasters. The State Disaster Management Agency told reporters during a recent press conference an estimated 1,500 trained volunteers have already stepped forward to operate the stations as they become available. The first station will be ready to go on the air shortly and will be based at the State Emergency Operations Center and the Secretariat Complex. The remaining eight still require proper licenses from the Ministry of Communication. The state officials said that 10 more automated rain gauges and 7 automated weather stations will also be installed in urban areas by India's Meteorological Department. Officials said they had hope that these additional measures would increase all teams' abilities to provide life-saving response in the state, which is prone to a variety of catastrophes, including flash floods, strong winds, and heat waves. And finally this week, writing on his blog, Andrew Brown, M0ONH, shares the details of his early symptoms, diagnosis, surgery, treatment, and recovery from prostate cancer at age 41. His medical journey began mid-2021 with visits to doctors to identify the source of his symptoms. He had surgery last spring. Andrew has been a ham since 2018, hence his call sign suffix ONH, standing for One New Ham. He began his blog as a way to encourage others to join him in amateur radio. Now he's making use of amateur radio to encourage others to do something more, be proactive in their own health care. He wants people to learn more about prostate cancer and help raise funds for research. Andrew has organized a special event station, GB8 PCA, with the support of three Essex clubs and Essex hams. Activation takes place on Saturday, August 13th from 1100 to 1600 local time and continuing through Monday, August 15th at 2000 hours. Here's another reason to make contact. For every logged QSO using the GB8 PCA call sign, Andrew will donate one pound himself. If you cannot contact him but want to support the cause, visit his Just Giving donation page. You can read more about Andrew's story on his blog. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, 
please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copy sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the KD5DMT 145.290 and 443.025 MHz repeater system in Centerton and Garfield, Arkansas. Owned and operated by the Benton County Radio Operators Club, serving Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri, and Northeast Oklahoma. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, wishing you... A second.